Hello, my name is Carolyn Gadette, and I'm the manager of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. So welcome to the Bird Species at Risk Management and Information Virtual Workshop. This is a joint workshop co-hosted by Nature Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. In the past, we've done these workshops in a small town uh, with a supper and a hands-on like ranch activity. Unfortunately, we can't meet in person or provide supper, but we can still share information. So we're happy you could join us tonight. I'd like to start by stating, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. This evening has a nice lineup of speakers. Uh, we'll start with Becky Magnus from Nature Saskatchewan providing an update on their programs and then we'll have Ian Cook from Birds Canada um, who will discuss the grasslands conservation incentives guide. Afterwards, and new to the schedule, I will give a short presentation on uh, grassland bird habitat attributes, which is a bit of a preview to our presentation that we'll be doing next week. And then we'll close out the evening with Lori Johnson with the Saskatchewan Brewing Owl Interpretive Center and a live owl whose name is Peanut. So just a little uh, housekeeping before we begin. Uh, PCAP and Nature Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, have another workshop next Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. We're currently advertising on social media and you can find more information on the uh, on PCAP's upcoming events uh, webpage. This uh, workshop is being recorded and will be uploaded to PCAP's YouTube channel in the near future. I would like to take a moment to thank um, or to note the, that financial support for today's workshop is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Mosaic Company, Saskatchewan Stock or Cattlemen's Association, TC Energy, the Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act, and ELSA Canada. And as a reminder to all of our listeners out there, you are currently muted and we can't see you in case that was a concern. Um, there is the option to only view the presentation and not the webcam if bandwidth is an issue where you are. Um, it's at the top of the screen. It's either everyone or webcams, and you can play around with those settings. If you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you're on a cell phone, you can send your questions to uh, the organizer by chat in the chat box. And questions will be answered at the end of each presentation as time permits. Now I will pass it over to Becky from Nature Saskatchewan to get our evening started. Thank you, Carolyn. And welcome everyone. So I get the fun part. Did someone say prizes? Yes. We're going to have three door prizes tonight to give away. And that will include two of our long sleeve Monarch Stewards of Saskatchewan shirts, as well as one of the coveted, very popular Birds of Saskatchewan book. With these prizes, we're going to include our 2021 Species at Risk calendar and an annual membership to Nature Saskatchewan. So if you're unable to stay for the whole evening, not to worry, you'll still be entered for the door prize and we'll be notified via email. So I just want to plug, though, that all of this merchandise and more is available online on our online store at naturesas.ca. All the proceeds go directly back to programming, so please check it out. Okay, so I'm gonna kick off our talk tonight and just give you a brief overview of Nature Saskatchewan as an organization before I talk about our habitat stewardship programs and where we're at. 
But before I dig in, I'm curious. So we're going to launch our first poll uh, so we can understand who each other are a little bit better. So Carolyn, I'll get you to launch that poll and please go ahead and answer and then uh, and then hopefully we can share the results. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Excellent. Nice to see so many people here tonight. This is this is great. It, it doesn't uh, replace our in-person events, but it's it's so great to to see everybody. So. Uh, thank you for being here. Okay, so Nature Saskatchewan, if you're not familiar with us, it, we were founded in 1949. We're a non-government charitable organization and we're membership, we're member based with close to 600 members and 16 local nature society affiliates. We're Saskatchewan's largest volunteer-driven nonprofit naturalist organization, and we pride ourselves on being a voice for nature in Saskatchewan. Nature's vision is humanity in harmony with nature, and our mission is to engage and inspire people to appreciate, learn about, and protect Saskatchewan's natural environment. So while Nature Saskatchewan has many different types of programs, I'll specifically focus on the Steward to Saskatchewan programs. The programs are aimed to conserve prairie habitat for all prairie species, but focus on their respective target species. The individual programs that you can see gate signs here for are slightly different based on their target species, but they were all modeled after the oldest and largest program, Operation Burring Owl, which was launched in 1987, followed by Rare Plant Rescue in 2002, Shrubs for Strikes in 2003, Plovers on Shore in 2008, and finally, the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program in 2010. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to do another poll, just for those of you that, that weren't quite sure how it worked last time, just to gauge your familiarity with, it, with uh, the programs tonight. So Carolyn, I'll get you to launch that poll. Okay, so let's see. I can't see Carolyn, you'll have to tell me. Um, so there's 3% yes, I am a participant. 63% have said yes, I have heard of them. And 34% have said no. Great, well a great mix. That is, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, so all of Nature Saskatchewan stewardship programs have four main goals, habitat stewardship, site identification and population monitoring, habitat enhancement, and education and awareness. So I'll briefly go through each of these goals and, and explain how we're achieving them. With habitat stewardship, our objective is to conserve habitat for the target species and other native prairie species through voluntary stewardship agreements and informed land stewardship. Participants sign voluntary handshake agreements in which they agree to conserve the nesting habitat for current or past records of species at risk. They also agree to annually report species observations on their land, and the agreement is non-binding and can be cancelled at any time, making this commitment attractive to many landowners. Currently, there are 931 program participants conserving nearly 475,000 acres of grassland habitat and 137 miles of shoreline habitat. So when we say informed stewardship, we mean confirming what practices 
participants are already doing to keep doing that are attracting the species and sharing opportunities and small tweaks that maybe they may consider for, future, for further enhancing or supporting the habitat. And we call these site-specific beneficial management practices plans. Through informed stewardship, we also make it a responsibility of ours to ensure we keep up to date on what options exist to support participants in stewarding the land. And one of those tools is a conservation easement. So this would ensure that they could leave a legacy for future generations and we would connect them with the host organizations to put legally binding measures in place to, for example, uh, prevent breaking native prairie. We do this by visiting landowners in person. Face-to-face -face landowner visits are a great way of creating initial relationships and is very important to us in maintaining the relationships over the years and decades to come. One of the most important activities is the annual population monitoring. Our objective is monitoring target population numbers and distribution changes through an annual census at participating sites. For most of our participants, this monitoring is done by them. We mail out a census card to all the participants every June and participants report their species observations along with any land use changes. Rare plant rescue, though, is a little different in that we do not expect them to go out and search for the rare plants walking pastures on their own all day. We have instead a search and monitoring crew that goes out each year just to do just that. They search for new occurrences and they monitor, monitor existing ones. So you can imagine this is a huge undertaking. With landowner permission, species occurrence information is given to the, the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center and a applicable recovery teams as well. The Conservation Data Center houses all species occurrence information for the province and allows us to monitor species populations in the province. No personal information is ever shared. Our habitat enhancement goal is to increase and improve habitat for burrowing owls, sprakes, pipits, and piping plovers. And some projects in the past were even undertaken to support loggerhead shrike foraging habitat near nesting sites. Habitat enhancement projects include that we work on include native seeding, wildlife friendly fencing, and alternative water development. Native seeding is done in order to convert cropland to pasture to enlarge pastures and reduce habitat fragmentation. Wildlife friendly fencing is supported in order to preserve newly seeded areas and to improve pasture health. The fencing includes a smooth top and bottom wire and some height restrictions to apply to help other wildlife jump over or crawl under the fence with ease. Alternative water development, such as solar pumps, is also supported to improve pasture health. With our education and awareness objective, we do two mail outs per year to our participants to keep them involved and to make them feel appreciated and know that they're recognized. The spring mail out includes a census card for each site enrolled, a spring update of our programs and our plans for the summer. The fall mail out includes an annual newsletter that keeps our participants informed of species at risk, our programs, other research and events going on around the province, as well as our very popular species at risk calendar. That's one of, that's gonna be in all the prizes tonight. We hold two to three conservation and awareness and appreciation events as an expression of our thanks and appreciation to our participants, except right now. We have tonight though, evenings like this, so we can still get together safely. It'll never replace our in-person gathering, so don't worry, we will have a delicious supper again. But just right now, this is what we have to do. And lastly, we also do other outreach activities, and you can see we do news releases, advertisements, ar articles, TV and radio interviews, presentations, and we attend events to increase awareness and encourage people to support species at risk sightings pre and post COVID times. The stewards that are involved in our program are really the backbone of everything we do. And they're the reason we've been able to continue for so many years. They are the ones that are managing and caring, caring for both the habitat and the species. It is because of their care that many of the species at risk we, that we deal with still have habitat. So a special thank you to all of you participants with us tonight. We are thinking about you and we cannot wait to get out to visit you again when we're allowed to. So what can you do? Reporting species at risk sightings is so important. It helps us monitor their population and distribution. 
If you're able, consider donating your time or money. Knowledge is powerful. Learn about species at risk and the habitats they rely on and tell others, just like you're doing this evening. Conserve existing habitat. This in turn will help conserve overall biodiversity. Join a naturalist organization like Nature Saskatchewan or one of our partners here tonight. And write letters to the government and encourage species at risk habitat conservation and support conservation partnerships. So if you spot a species at risk, call us to report it. Take a couple seconds right now and save this number in your phone. If you spot or think you've spotted any species at risk, give us a call. You can call our toll-free hootline and your call will help determine the abundance and distribution of species at risk in Saskatchewan. Please know that caller information is kept confidential and personal information is never shared without permission. This includes the person reporting the sighting and the landowner where the species is seen. So with that, thank you. I can answer any questions, but first I just need to thank all of our partners and supporters and all those who have contributed to the programs in varying capacities over the years. A lot has happened in over ne nearly 35 years. So when they say it takes a community, we truly believe it takes the whole community and everyone coming together like tonight. Acknowledging not only our part collectively as a broader community, but our parts that we individually play in the smaller communities as well. So I thank you. Carolyn, back to you. Thanks, Becky. Um, there are a few questions and we have a few minutes. Um, sure. The first is, does putting up birdhouses help loggerhead strikes? I once had a family of these birds nest in one wooden birdhouse in one of two trees in front of my house. There are a number of unique nesting sites that I have seen over the last 13 years that loggerhead shikes will utilize. There is textbook that says, yes, they like densely dense shrubs at about chest height. And uh, but that being said, we have seen shrikes in everywhere from 30 feet up in an elm tree to down at my knees in a spruce tree to a bundle of barbed wire in the middle of it. So I'm not surprised to hear that a birdhouse would be utilized by a loggerhead shrike if, if that's what they felt was the best opportunity for them in the area. So uh, sorry if that's a vague answer. I, I, you know, it's not something we, uh, we encourage or, or showcase as loggerhead shrike ideal uh, habitat. Really the loggerhead shrike uh, preferred habitat and what we try and mimic is sort of pre uh, pre-settlement times when the loggerhead shrike really relied on those coolie species like hawthorns and buff buffalo berries. They loved the dense shrubs that had that had thorns on them because of their uh, because of their action, their hunting habits of impaling their their prey on thorns or in the deep wise of branches. Great, thank you so much, Becky. Um, that's all the time we have for uh, questions for Becky, but I see that there's a burrowing owl question and we can ask that one of Lori later on in the evening. Thanks so much, Becky. I will move on to Ian. Um, so just a bit about our next presenter. Ian Cook is the Grassland Conservation Manager with Birds Canada, and he is also a professional agrologist as well as a certified crop advisor in Manitoba. Go ahead, Ian. Great, thank you very much. You can see my presentation and hear me okay, Carolyn? Yes. Great, well, thank you. Um, so this evening, I'm gonna be talking to you about Birds Canada's work on the Canadian prairies and a new publication that we have out called the Grasslands Conservation Incentives Guide and how hopefully that can be used as a tool to connect producers and landowners with the different programs that exist out on the landscape for stewardship activities. So like Carolyn mentioned, I am the Grassland Conservation Manager with Birds Canada and as a non-profit charitable organization, we've been around since, you know, 1960 actually is our 60th year this year. 
And that's been under a number of different banners, but we now exist at Birds Canada. And our mission is to conserve the wild birds of Canada through a number of different avenues. And our work has a direct impact on conservation action from the provincial level all the way to the international level. And we really view the world on how we can help birds, but ultimately we know that people are the main source of that solution. And on the Canadian prairies, in that context, ranchers and farmers and other landowners are the most important people for the future of our prairie birds. And the Canadian prairies are a really important place for a huge diversity and abundance of birds. And this map from Ducks Unlimited shows the four major migratory routes that birds follow and to get from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds and nesting grounds in the summer. And each one of those symbols represents a bird that was banded and then recaptured along the route. And you can see that birds from the Pacific, Central and Mississippi Flyway used the Canadian prairies quite heavily, either as a stopover point to get to their nesting grounds further north, or they used the Canadian prairies to nest and raise their young all summer. So the Canadian prairies with their grasslands and wetlands, or sorry, the prairie ecosystem as a whole with the wetlands and the grasslands and the riparian areas are thought by some to be important to more birds and more bird species than any other ecosystem in North America. So I have a little bit of a question here for you that Carolyn's going to queue up, I think, and just to see what you think, how our birds are doing in North America. So we'll give that a few seconds here. Great, so I guess we'll probably call it there. Now you can't see it, Carolyn, so you'll have to tell me how it turned out. Okay, so 88% um, answered 25%, uh, and 12% answered 10%. Okay, so everybody's on kind of the right on the right track there. Yeah, unfortunately, we've lost. Uh, nearly, our, we've lost a quarter of our birds in North America since 1970, which works out to nearly 3 billion individuals that have gone since 1970. And the group of species that has suffered the heaviest losses are the grassland birds and aerial insectivores, which make their homes on the Canadian prairies, especially those grassland birds. And this is worrisome because birds fill a lot of different roles in the ecosystem and exist at multiple different levels in the food web so they can really be good indicators of ecosystem health so with these declines you know that has impacts across the food web up to and including ourselves so to put some faces and names to the declines or the declining numbers um, these are Four of some pretty iconic grassland specialists that do occur on the Canadian prairies. And it's these grassland specialists that are seeing the heaviest declines with three out of the four here uh, with a threatened status federally. It's Baird, Baird Sparrow is um, a, a species of special concern, uh, but the other three are listed as threatened, which means that they've seen pretty substantial declines. So what's causing this? Many of you will know that it's habitat degradation and loss that's causing these grassland bird declines. And so I won't harp on that too much, but just to put it into perspective for a grassland bird, that if we look at the Northern Great Plains and include some of those Northern states like Montana and the Dakotas, we are losing around one acre of grassland on average every minute in the northern great plains so if we think about some of those birds that we saw on the previous page like a chestnut collar long spur they'll stake out and defend a area of about one to two acres in order to raise their young on a grassland 
So if we're losing an acre every minute, then those birds are losing a potential home nearly every one to two minutes. So obviously the, on the prairies, we're part of a working landscape and many producers and landowners know how important the habitats that occur on their land are. And we've spoken to many producers one-on-one -on -one and through surveys, and we know that many of them want to be able to participate in programs and incentives that help them provide habitat for these birds and other wildlife, while also providing other ecological goods and services. But many find it difficult or time-consuming to track these down, and many producers just don't know what's all available to them. So we produce the Grassland Conservation Incentives Guide uh, that compiles the programs and incentives that are available across the prairie provinces that help producers and landowners preserve, improve, or restore the prairie habitats that occur on their land. Um, so with this guide, we hope to remove the time commitment barrier of finding incentives by compiling them into an easy to use guide. And so that producers and landowners know what's available to them and have the information to decide what program best fits their situation and their production goals and their ecological goals as well. So in this guide, there are over 45 different incentives and funding sources within it. And there are also some information on the prairie birds that they may be helping when they participate, as well as some additional resources. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. So this is what the guide looks like. I'm just gonna go through a few screenshots just to show you how it can be used as a tool. And right now it's, our, it's only available online. And that's just because funding changes, programs change quite often. And if we were to print it, it would be out of date fairly quickly, unfortunately. So it can be downloaded from uh, the Birds Canada website with the URL at the bottom there. And I'll post that again at the end of the presentation. And the guide itself is structured uh, with national and provincial programs. And with it being a downloadable PDF, all of these head headings are linked. So if you were done reading the national programs and you wanted to skip to the Saskatchewan section, you could just click on the Saskatchewan heading in the table of contents and skip right there. Or if you wanted to find out more about the nature saskatchewan programs that we just heard about you can skip to that too so a lot of these national programs may be familiar to you and and to producers but uh, there is one that is a pretty new that we included in the guide and that's this canada grassland project protocol and this is an opportunity for landowners to generate carbon offsets to sell in the voluntary carbon market. And these carbon offsets could be could provide an additional revenue stream to landowners that are keeping pasture land and hayland intact. And something that's quite interesting about this uh, program is that it's a market-based solution. It's treating the carbon sequestration like a product and a market is paying for a service that you're providing. So it's um, got a lot of potential in that way. So to be eligible, a landowner has to have land that's currently in grass that's at risk of conversion to annual cropping systems. And so most of the land that is going to be enrolled has to be class one to four land. It doesn't all have to be, but the majority of it does. Native and tame grasslands are eligible for this protocol but they'd have to be in grass for 10 years plus a conservation easement does need to be placed on the land uh, in order to assure some sort of permanence uh, but term easements are eligible as far as i understand but you would get a little bit of a discount on on what you're able to claim as far as a offset and then of course, moderate haying and grazing is allowed, and you know, typically what producers do within their normal si system would be allowed within this protocol. So this is entering its pilot phase at the moment, it's, so it's not fully up and running, um, but we wanted to include the information in this guide 
in order to help prairie producers and landowners get familiar with carbon markets so that when this and other carbon credit opportunities do become available, they're able to take advantage of them right away. And sometimes obtaining an easement can take um, a little while. So if producers, if you're thinking about putting an easement on a piece of land and this may be a good opportunity to get that done so that you can take advantage of protocols like this. So this is just a list of, or this is a picture of the table of contents with the provincial programs listed on it. And I'm not gonna go through each one individually, but I just wanted to say that there is a large diversity of programs available in, in Saskatchewan and across the prairies. And I think that there should be a program just to fit just about every situation out there, I think. And I just wanted to say that if there is an organization that didn't have anything that would fit with your situation in the past, I would encourage you to check the, these organizations out again. There's lots of new and innovative programs going on out there, and there might just be something that fits now. So make sure you're checking them out and keep checking back too for updates. Okay, so time for my second little quiz question here. And Carolyn, if you want to fire that up. And just, we saw Nature Saskatchewan's entry there. Um, so probably the previous presentation kind of gave it away, so everybody should get this right. But uh, does Nature Saskatchewan provide funding directly to producers and landowners for species at risk habitat enhancement work? True or false? So I'll give that a few seconds. All right, that's probably okay. So I'm sharing the results. You still can't see them? No, I can't, but. Okay. So 67% uh, said true and 33% said false. Okay. And so most of you got that like it and right, and that is that is true. So Nature Saskatchewan does provide some funding to producers and landowners for species at risk habitat enhancement work. So if you're looking at doing some enhancement work on your land, then make sure to keep Nature Saskatchewan in mind. And just as an example of what a provincial entry looks like in the guide. This is Nature Saskatchewan's entry and you can see that there's a fair bit of detail here and we didn't want to just produce a guide that had organizations with links to their their web pages. We wanted to provide enough detail so that you could understand how the program worked, what the payment structure was, and what the eligibility requirements were so that you have enough detail to form a pretty good idea of what programs might fit your situation and you can weigh the pros and cons of each and that sort of thing. So um, we, of course, want you to contact these organizations before you get too far down the road of planning or doing any work to make sure that you do fit the eligibility. So that is kind of the main part of the Conservation Incentives Guide. The last two sections are the additional resources and prairie bird section and the additional resources has a bunch of different links for best management practices for species at risk and also for pasture and rangeland health and you can access these resources in the document just by clicking on those headings so the saskatchewan prairie conservation action plan has a wide range and plethora of really good um, resources available and some of those are linked here and no matter and yeah and then on the prairie birds side we have information about 18 different prairie birds that producers and landowners might be helping when they participate in these programs and here we have some other resources linked like the Merlin bird ID app so if you're getting started or you wanted an app to help you with your bird ID, that's a really good tool to have in your pocket and be able to enter in 
where you are and what the bird's size was and color was, and it tells you, uh, gives you a list of some birds that it could be. So it's a really handy and really useful tool. So this is just an example of an entry in the prairie bird section, which and it's going to be the loggerhead shrike here, our favorite bird of the night. And so there's some information on what the bird looks like and some ID tips. And there are also links to what each bird sounds like, and as well as what kind of habitat conditions they might occupy on your land and where they are found usually on the prairies. And then in the last section, there are some interesting facts about behavior and information on their conservation status, and as well as some conservation actions that landowners can take. So we were talking about um, loggerhead shrike liking um, those native shrubs like hawthorn and buffalo berry earlier. So if a producer, you are taking part in a riparian area restoration program, then consider those native species to do your restoration with. And then just to kind of finish off here a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about what producers and landowners can do in order to help prairie birds. So the number one thing that um, we can do as landowners and producers is to keep that native prairie intact. I, that's the that's the number one best thing, and we probably all know that. Uh, the second thing is participate in programs like the habitat um, stewardship programs through Nature Saskatchewan or other programs available in the guide. You know these alternative watering systems, invasive species control, and and rotational grazing and all these things have a role to play in the conservation of our prairie birds and grassland birds. So check out what incentives are available and see what fits your situation and participate. Uh, the third thing that uh, we can do is do some bird friendly haying. So either if you can delay haying by until that July 15th on some portions of your hayland or using lighter stocking rates or keeping um, heavy stocking rates off those lands until July 15th. And that really helps a lot of those ground nesting grassland birds to be able to raise their young to a point where they can leave the nest and fledge and be able to get out of the way of cow's hooves or haying equipment. And then the other thing that can be done is cutting in an inside out pattern. So it helps those birds flush out from the hay field into the surrounding landscape. When we go outside in, then it tends to concentrate those birds in the middle and um, they can't escape quite as well. And then there are other things that you can do like put flushing bars on haying equipment to give birds just that little bit of extra time to get out of the road of the hay line. <clears throat> And then the last thing, if you are establishing new pastures or you're taking areas of annual cropland out of production or into forage production, consider using those native grasses. And, uh, or if you're putting in windbreaks, use native trees and shrubs. And that can go a long way to helping these birds out because that's what species they've evolved with. And then, um, Rebecca did some great things that how everyone can help bird or help species at risk and I'm going to echo a lot of those sentiments but uh, what we can all do to help out birds and number one is buy bird friendly. Our purchasing decisions can have a really positive effect on birds and support systems that pro are providing habitat for birds. So lots of us like to drink coffee Buying coffee that is bird friendly certified helps provide quality habitat on those wintering grounds for a lot of our Canadian birds when they winter in Central and South America. And then buying Canadian beef or, or Canadian grass fed beef really supports those systems that provide habitat for a large diversity of prairie birds. <clears throat> now, number two, prevent window collisions. Um, it's estimated that 25 million birds a year die in Canada when they collide with windows. And many of those collisions are on residential homes and not just on big glass skyscrapers. So there are lots of inexpensive options for 
purchase or do-it-yourself solutions to prevent birds from flying into windows. And when I say, you know, inexpensive, I mean, you know, it's even as simple as getting a paint marker and drawing designs on your windows or putting strings up in front of your windows, just so birds can see that that's not a passage way through your house. <clears throat> Number three is uh, keeping cats indoors. Um, outside of habitat loss, cats are the biggest threat to birds in Canada. They kill 100, at least 100 million birds annually in Canada, and some estimates think 300 million. So keeping your cats inside as much as possible, I know that on the farm or ranch, they serve as a rodent control, but if you do have a house cat or a barn cat or a shop cat, try to keep them indoors as much as possible. And if they are outside some of the time, make sure that they're spayed or neutered to prevent stray cats because those cats that have to hunt to survive uh, really have a big toll on our wild bird population. <clears throat> Number four, welcome birds home. You can plant native vegetation in your yard that, you know, that provides food and forage for those birds in year round. And also, you know, building bird houses or bird feeders goes a long way to helping those birds out when they're made a long trip from down south or on their way back down south um, or over winter as well. And number five, like Rebecca mentioned, just learn about birds. You know, they lead fascinating lives and are a lot of fun to learn about. And building bird feeders and bird houses are great activities that you can do with kids and the whole family can watch them scrap over food and that sort of thing. And that's a lot of fun. And Birds Canada offers a lot of really exciting opportunities for people to get involved in citizen or community science programs, which provide us with a lot of great data to monitor bird population trends across the country. And it's really important scientific data that gets used in our work. So a great project or great program to start with is uh, Project Feeder Watch, which is, goes on until the end of April. And you can do that from your kitchen table. It's a really great program. So that ends my presentation. Uh, if you're interested in looking at the guide, you can go to our website, birdscanada.org slash birdscience and grassland birds at risk. And keep checking back for updated versions. And if you're interested in any of those citizen science programs, please visit birdscanada slash you can help slash citizen science and if there are any questions that don't get answered tonight please feel free to drop me a line either by email or you can call me as well and i'd like to just thank anw and environment climate change canada for their support of this uh, incentives guide thank you so much ian that was great we have some great questions that have come in um, one from Ethan asks, is there a way to find out where to purchase from the producers who are doing their best for stewardship by participating in these programs? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, nothing that comes necessarily to the top of mind other than, you know, reaching out to local producers and, you know, there are direct to consumer is becoming more and more popular. So there are a number of producers that are doing that and advertise online or on websites. So, you know, if you Google search and see what producers are doing that in your area and, and maybe just calling them up and asking them what stewardship they're doing, or maybe they have that information online. Um, but that's a good point. I don't know of that and if I, I do come across something like that, I, I will make sure to pass that along to Carolyn. Um, there is one comment in the question box from Tom that says, check Metocrosity app. It's an app, I guess. Okay. Might have that. Um, the next question is uh, from Michelle. Where can you get bird-friendly coffee? Never heard of that. Okay, yeah, so there's a company out of Southern Ontario uh, called Birds and Beans, and they have um, 
yeah, bird friendly coffee that's Smithsonian certified and they ship right to your door. And um, I believe if you enter a promo code Birds Canada, part of your purchase goes to funding our research and programs as well. So that's called Birds and Beans. And I think there are a few others, but uh, that's the most prominent one in Canada at this time. That is very cool. Um, I think the last, maybe one last question is from Daniel. It says, why was Nature Conservancy of Canada not listed as one of the provincial programs? Ah, yes, so it's more just the way that we organized it. Um, in talking with Nature Conservancy of Canada, we decided to put it in the national program because they they operate in all three prairie provinces. However, there is information about their work in each province under that national program, Nature Conservancy entry. So where they work in both Man in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. So the information is in there is just under national programs. Awesome, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Um, so thank you so much, Ian, for joining us today. And it's a really neat guide that you guys have. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Okay, so next is me. Let's see what I can do here. Um, so as I mentioned, I have a quick presentation on um, as a preview for next week. So since this is a workshop about bird species at risk management, I thought it might be a good idea to give a preview of our multi-species guide uh, that we'll be discussing next week, but only focusing on some birds. So today I'll be focusing on these four species, the Sprague's Pipit, the Baird Sparrow, the chestnut color Longspur, and the thick thick-billed longspur, which was previously known as the McCallan's longspur. So it's the same four specialists that Ian had mentioned. Um, Dr. Stephen Davis from the Canadian Wildlife Service ran this analysis for PCAP. Steve and his grad students have been studying grassland songbirds in Saskatchewan since the mid 90s. Um, so the results that I'll be going through today are from 5,000 uh, data points throughout Southern Saskatchewan. The data points have been split up between uh, the moist mixed grassland, so in this kind of peachy pink color, um, and the mixed grassland ecoregion. But today I'll only talk about the data from the mixed grassland ecoregion eco eco just for the sake of time. So I'll be giving the results for a few habitat attributes. Uh, so vegetation height, so that's like the drooping height of uh, the dead vegetation in a plot, residual cover. So this is the amount of uh, dead grass that's remaining within a quadrat. So how much of the quadrat is covered by dead grass and biocrust, which is also known as like dead or bare ground, but it's not actually bare ground. It's mostly like spike moss and lichens that cover the ground. So on this graph, um, you can see vegetation height on the y-axis and the four bird species on the x-axis. Uh, the dark green is in that optimal range uh, for that particular attribute for the species, and the shaded green is like the suboptimal range. Um, as you can see, Baird's and Sprague's pipit are very similar. There's lots of overlap. They prefer taller vegetation, whereas long spurs prefer shorter vegetation, which is consistent with what we know about the species. Um, for percent re residual dead grass, again, it's on the y-axis. Birds are on at the bottom. And this, the color is the same. Dark green is optimal. Shaded green is suboptimal. And, uh, and again, it's similar where the Baird Sparrow and the Sprague's Pipit are overlapping quite well, whereas the long spurs prefer very little residual cover. And the thick-billed long spur, even more so, 
than the chestnut colored lung spur. And I want you to take a good look at this graph and then we'll pop over to the bio crest. And this one will be the same setup um, with the bio crest on the y axis, but the pipits and the Baird sparrow prefer less bare ground and the long spurs prefer more bare ground or bio crest. And it makes sense that they would be the opposite of the previous graph. Less residual grass cover means you can see more of the ground. Um, so the point of showing you all that data was to kind of describe like this concept. So the one thing that is consistent between these three habitat attributes is that there is very little overlap between species that prefer taller, denser vegetation, so the Baird Sparrow and the Sprague's Pipit, versus the ones that prefer the shorter, sparser vegetation, like the long spurs. Um, there is some overlap, but it's mostly in that suboptimal category. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that the relationship between these species and the habitat attributes may vary from year to year due to uh, precipitation, bumps in like bird populations and that kind of thing. And these results came out as statistically significant over all years, regardless of any like year to year variability. So in terms of management for bird species at risk, heterogeneity is key. It's very important while managing for multiple species where there might be short spark sparse vegetations in certain areas or taller, denser vegetation in others. And so um, we just need that patchy grassland, like a mosaic of different habitat types. And if you aim to manage grasslands to fit only that like small range where most species will overlap, you'll probably provide mostly like suboptimal habitat as land managers likely know their land and their livestock better than anyone. There might be like natural low productivity areas like um, solonectic soils or uh, on top of hills and that kind of thing that might offer that short sparse vegetation that long spurs uh, prefer naturally. And chances are that if species at risk are present, grasslands are being managed well for the species. So it's something that Nature Sask often tells their producers that if you have species at risk, that you're doing something right. And um, also, if you're going to make any changes to how you manage your land, make sure to speak to a professional um, that can provide like sound advice in terms of managing grasslands. Um, so next week, we'll talk more about the multi-species at risk guide um, that will include like 12 species. Um, and there's some habitat attributes that overlap and contrast between species. It's also an illustrated guide. So here's a prototype of how the information like would be shown, hopefully making it easier to understand than just like a bunch of graphs and descriptions for someone who's going out into the landscape and looking at um, the actual grasslands and trying to figure out what they're looking for. Um, and the point of the guide is to, um, the idea is that we can provide landowners with the information about what the species need, and then land, landowners can take that into account if they want to attract those species. Of course, there's no like guarantee that they would attract the species, but you can hope for a field of dreams types of scenario where, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, that's all I had for today. Just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Steve Davis from the CWS and our contractors who are currently working on this project, Sue, Heather, and Eric. Um, what time is it? I have a few questions, or I have a few um, minutes for questions before we move on to um, Lori's presentation. 
there is a question from Jasmine. Says, are these species often parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds? Um, yes. I, like brown-headed cowbirds are generalists, so they can pretty much parasitize any grassland bird. Um, from like my masters looking at grassland songbirds uh, north of Maple Creek, um, parasitism was actually very low on my sites compared to other areas, but it's very possible. And I don't see any other questions coming oh, coming through. So I will um, find Lori. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, there we are. Hi, Lori. Good evening, everybody. So we have Lori and Peanut from the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center. Uh, the Interpretive Center is in Moose Jaw and first opened its doors to the public in 1997. Uh, Lori has been the owl coordinator at the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center since 2010. Uh, so welcome, Lori. Thank you very much, Carolyn, and thank you so much for inviting us to join everybody tonight. Um, Peanut was a little difficult to get just up, so I hope he's going to behave through, through the presentation, but uh, if not, um, we'll just have to get through it anyways. And we're starting off pretty good already, eh? <laughs> so I'd like to start with just a little bit of background information about the center itself. Um, the Burrowing Owl Center has been in existence for approximately 24 years now. And it came about as a partnership between the Moose Jaw Exhibition Company and several different other uh, nature organizations um, in Saskatchewan. And the reason why the center was, um, was opened was because the burrowing owls were listed as an endangered species here in Saskatchewan in 1995. And historically, the areas around Moose Jaw and Regina um, were a hot spot for a population of burrowing owls that returned um, to the area year after year to use various locations as nesting sites. So we saw it as an opportunity to get people interested and a bit more knowledgeable about what was occurring in our wild populations of burrowing owls. So it is the center's mandate to promote the conservation of the burrowing owls and their prairie habitat through education, stewardship, and ecotourism. And we do that by hosting in-house tours and an outreach uh, program known as Owls on Tour. And we're very lucky to actually have several hand-raised owls um, that we can utilize in our programs to give everybody the opportunity to see these little guys up close and personal. And Peanut is actually one of those ambassador owls. So he was actually hatched right here at the center and he's been working with us for almost six years now. Um, he is a full grown male and um, he is um, one of our better known um, ambassador owls just because he's so outgoing and he can be a little difficult at times, but uh, that just means he's got lots of personality. And Burrowing owls are an amazing species. We're very lucky um, to be able to have these birds um, in Canada, in Saskatchewan. And um, the rest of the talk is kind of going to center about um, some of the factors affecting our endangered population here in Canada, as well as some of the characteristics that make these guys stand out among all other owl species. And probably the most interesting thing is the fact that these guys are the only owl species to nest underground. And that's actually how they came by their name, burrowing owls. Um, now, even though they like to, uh, to nest underground in burrows, these guys don't normally dig their own. Um, so they have a relationship with a, a lot of other common prairie inhabitants, such as ground squirrels, prairie dogs, and badgers. And these guys will utilize burrows that those other mammals have, uh, have left behind or abandoned. 
And they are the only owls in the world to do that. Um, and on the grasslands here, um, we do have a lot of those types of fossorial mammals. So the grasslands are the perfect type of habitat for burrowing owls. So you do find them in the southern parts of Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and BC, as well as throughout um, some of the states and down into Central and South America. Um, but it is the Canadian population that is um, classified as endangered. And they were first listed as a threatened species in the late 70s. But by the late 1980s, um, our population had declined by nearly 95%. <laughs> Um, and they were first listed um, as an endangered species in 1997. And that classification um, remains the same um, to this day. And it is estimated that there is anywhere between 500 and 1,000 pairs of wild burrowing owls remaining in the Canadian provinces, Canadian prairie provinces. Um, and so there is a lot of work that is being done to, you know, to help um, our native species uh, survive here on the prairies and talks like this are just one of the ways that we can help them and these little guys are an amazing bird um, you know they they are very iconic here on the prairies and they are a very good indicator species as to the health or by our the health of a habitat or the biodiversity of a habitat so if you've got burrowing owls um, on your land or in areas, um, you know that it is it is a healthy, uh, biodiverse habitat. So we're going to just talk a little bit about what makes these guys so special. And we did mention that they are the only owls to nest underground. And um, because they do spend a lot of time on the ground, um, some of their hunting behaviors differ a little bit from um, most other owl species, as do some of their prey items. These guys will um, utilize a diet um, that consists of a lot of insects, such as grasshoppers, beetles, butterflies, moths, um, as well as small reptiles, amphibians, and um, rodents, and birds as well. But because they do eat a lot of insects and reptiles, these guys will often chase down their food um, on foot, uh, very much like a roadrunner. So they're not strictly um, ambush hunters like a lot of the other owl species. Although they are very strong flyers, the Canadian population of burrowing owls is actually a migratory species. So we only see them here on the Canadian prairies um, for a breeding season, which typically begins the end of April um, and they will remain here until they're ready to make their fall migration in late uh, September, early October. So when they return to the prairies, um, it is for a breeding season. Burrowing owls um, typically do not always return to the areas um, where they had previously nested. Um, so they have very low site fidelity, um, particularly among females. So um, many producers will often tell, tell us that for years, you know, they had, um, you know, pairs of burrowing owls um, that utilized their pasture lands as, as nesting sites. And then all of a sudden, one year, the owls didn't return. And that's a very common, um, you know, piece of information that we receive from a lot of, of um, you know, ranchers and farmers. And unfortunately, it is an indicator of, um, our low uh, population density here in Canada. Another thing is um, that it is also um, shows at how much uh, habitat loss and fragmentation does affect uh, the population of burrowing owls. That is probably one of the biggest factors affecting our population here in Canada. Um, and it's one thing that um, organizations here tonight are, are, are trying to, um, to help, um, trying to help, uh, you know, establish more areas where um, the the habitat is is kept intact, or returned to a natural type of prairie. <clears throat> so once these little guys do return to the prairies, typically um, 
they will pair up rather quickly um, and a female will lay anywhere between eight and 12 eggs. Um, and she will sit on those eggs for 28 to 29 days before they start to hatch. So during that time, the females will remain underground for almost 24 hours a day um, for the first two weeks. Um, and during that time, the males are hunting um, and bringing back uh, food for the females, as well as guarding the entrance to the burrows. Once the chicks hatch, um, the females can start spending a little bit more time away from the nest, particularly about after the two week period when the chicks are um, strong enough to physically move around a bit better and also able to regulate their body temperature. And um, by the time a burrowing owl chick is about six to seven weeks old, they are almost fully uh, independent of their parents. And by the time that eight week age, um, they are um, living on their own and hunting on their own. Although they will typically stay in burrows close to the, to the home burrow site until everybody is ready to leave in the fall. And um, our, our population here um, will travel down to central Texas and our southern Texas, excuse me, and central Mexico for a winter and um, they will typically return again in the spring. Um, not a lot is known about uh, their um, migratory paths or some of their behaviors on their wintering grounds. So studies are still being done to, to, to gather more information on that. And, um, you know, although a lot of the organizations here are, are striving to protect um, species like the burrowing owls and their prairie habitat, it has to be a collaborative uh, partnership between, you know, um, many organizations, many countries um, to be able to ensure that uh, this species continues to thrive here or, um, continues to thrive here on the prairies and even um, starts to thrive better. So that's kind of our presentation for tonight, everybody. And I'd love to be able to answer some questions. Okay, so we have one question from earlier today from Caden, who is 10 years old. And their question is, how do burrowing owls make their homes? That's a really good question, Caden. And these guys, um, they don't really do a lot of their own nest digging. They instead will use burrows that have been left behind by other animals that like to dig and that are a little bit better suited for digging, such as the gophers, the prairie dogs, or the badgers. And the burrowing owls will move into these burrows that have been left behind. And they can do a little bit of, you know, rearranging or um, redecorating, but they don't typically tend to build or dig their own burrows. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, here's a question from Jasmine. Are the other owls in the center more well-behaved than Peanut? <laughs> you know, it, it all depends. Sometimes um, our ambassador owls um, can be very, very good, and other times not so good. Um, you know, unfortunately, due to the COVID um, virus this year, we haven't been able to do a lot of outreach tours. So, oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, um, he's he's coming back to work after a long period off, and he's a little upset that he actually has to do some work. Um, <laughs> but. It, it kind of depends upon the day. Sometimes they're well behaved and other times they are not. Just like we are, I guess. Everybody has their moments. For sure. Um, the next question is from Eric. What are the main predators to burrowing owls? Unfortunately, these little guys do have a long list of predators, but some of the main ones that you find here on the prairies are larger birds of prey. Um, hawks, even larger owl species like the great horned owl and the short-eared owl, 
as well as badgers. Um, and badgers can be particularly detrimental to a population of burrowing owls because they can actually dig right down into the burrows um, and consume the eggs and the chicks as well as take an adult burrowing owl. And then any of the ground dwelling car carnivores, you know, from um, small weasels up to, you know, foxes and coyotes have been known to prey on burrowing owls as well. Okay, so do the owls hunt both day and night? And that question is from Ken. Yes, they do. They're actually one of the few diurnal species of owls. So they are active throughout the daylight hours and they're classified as crepuscular hunters. So they do the majority of their hunting at dawn and dusk, although they are active throughout the day. Great, thank you. The next question is from David. And how long does it take for that large clutch to hatch? Um, they usually hatch within 29 days and they will, the eggs will actually hatch in the order that they were laid. So the first egg laid is going to be the first egg that hatches. And because usually they have a larger clutch size, um, anywhere between five and 12 with eight or nine being an average, you can actually see a bit of a size difference between the oldest chick and the youngest chick in the nest. And Nathaniel wants to know how far west into BC does their habitat expand and do they live in the mountains as well or just the prairies? No, they, um, they live within the um, kind of an area within the Okanagan Valley. Um, and it, it was actually thought that um, the uh, BC burrowing owls were a different subspecies from the owls that we find here on the, um, the prairies, um, you know, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, or Alberta. But um, as more research is, genetic research is being done, it's found that there's really not um, such a difference between, between the species. So, um, there are some overlaps, perhaps, and, and um, perhaps some different flight path uh, or migratory paths that um, have allowed the, the, the two populations to mix a little bit. Okay. Um, I think there was a question about how old Peanut was. Peanut is going to be, He's going to be six years old this summer, actually. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. So if anyone wants to continue to type in their questions, um, you're welcome to do so. We have Lori for another like 15 minutes, <laughs> as long as there's questions. I mean, if there aren't any, we'll, we'll end early, but. Um, what's the average lifespan of a burrowing owl in the, in the wild versus in captivity? In the wild, they actually have one of the shorter lifespan um, of the owl species typically anywhere between three and six years in the wild. In captivity, of course, we, we can guarantee them a longer lifespan. And typically it's anywhere between six and eight years in captivity. Okay, and Tessa wants to know, where did you find Peanut? Peanut was actually hatched right here at the center. Um, both of his parents came to us from the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Project. Um, and they were both um, owls that were part of the breeding population there. <clears throat> but yeah, cricket, our peanut was born right here, um, as were most of our other hand-raised owls. Several of our wild um, captive owls, though, um, came to us from various locations around Saskatchewan, and they were found as injured birds or birds that had failed to migrate for some reason. <clears throat> And so um, since you've been at the center since 2010, did you hand raise peanut? I did, yes. Do you want to tell our 
uh, viewers a little bit about what that includes? Of course. It, it's quite an experience um, uh, hand raising an owl. Um, it's a lot like raising a, 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 any other type of baby. They require a lot of care, um, typically feedings. Um, so we take them from, we allow the, the owl parents to um, hatch the eggs naturally. And we will take the youngest owl from the nest when we want to hand raise um, a new owl for the educational programming. And typically we'll take the youngest owl um, because um, with a large clutch size, sometimes the younger owls are, are weaker and less likely to survive than the older members of the clutch. So by taking the youngster, we can ensure um, you know, a, a greater survival rate for the, the entire uh, family. And once we do that, we typically become like any other parent. So we're, we're doing um, feedings every four to five hours throughout the day um, and even throughout the night. So some nights you're up, you know, at midnight um, cutting up owl, uh, owl food, which is typically mice that we will feed and we will hand feed them. And um, we do, um, we start to handle them um, when they are physically able to um, stand. So usually by the time they are about four weeks old, they're, they're physically strong enough to, to be able to stand and walk around. And then from that point on, we will just um, make sure that we are handling them so they get used to that as well as slowly introducing them to um, things that they would encounter um, when we are doing presentations. So um, gradually introduce them to small groups of people as well as um, you know different environments. I'm sorry, he's trying to skitter away from me here. <laughs> And then we'll also start to get them used to the equipment that they, um, they are on when they're doing a, a presentation so that they can't get too far away from us. Um, so I guess to follow up on flying, uh, how far will they fly from the nest to hunt? Like in the wild? In the wild? Um, Typically, they will have a um, an area of anywhere between two to five square kilometers around the nesting site that they will utilize um, for for hunting. But again, it would depend a little bit upon um, food availability as well. So if prey items aren't uh, heavily or readily available in that area, they may travel a little bit further. But typically they don't travel like very long distances for hunting. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons why an insect diet is so important to these guys because they can often um, hunt uh, insects without having to go too far away from the nest. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few questions about uh, livestock operations. So the first is from James. Um, is there a correlation between an increase in cropping versus livestock operations and the decline of burrowing owl populations? Uh, well, habitat fragmentation um, has been a, a factor that does affect the population of burrowing owls. And um, a lot of times you, you do see it um, a bit more in um, areas where there are agricultural practices. Um, and there are studies though that um, argue that burrowing owls can do just as well um, in areas that um, are being used for agriculture. So it kind of depends on, on what, you know, what research you're looking at. But definitely habitat fragmentation um, of any type can uh, disrupt the, the movements of the burrowing owls. 
um, and limit their ability to find burrows, um, particularly if there are areas where um, you know, those burrowing mammals have been eradicated. And you will often find that in areas where there is a higher concentration of human, um, human population or human activities. So um, you can, you know, you can see, you can see sometimes the population will decrease in areas um, where, um, activity has just started up and in other places you know they seem to be quite comfortable with a small amount of human activity so um, I think there is a lot of other compounding factors that affect the population as well um, when you start to see um, you know those types of practices it's not ne just necessarily one thing that you can pinpoint um, it's a, a it's a it's a um, a combining of factors that can affect the burrowing owls and their population. So it's it's kind of a difficult question to answer for me, um, but I hope that helped. And do you have, uh, I guess, any advice for cattle producers? Like how should they graze their cattle around burrows? Is there a concern about grass being too long or Conversely, concerns about trampling if you do graze around burrows. Right. Um, it's actually, you see, a bit more of a problem when the grass is too long around the burrows. Burrowing owls tend to like shorter grass around their burrows because um, it allows them better visibility. And um, so, you know, um, Active grazing in, in an area where there are burrowing owls um, is not necessarily going to um, going to disrupt them, um, and they um, they actually have a very good relationship with a lot of the grazing mammals because they will utilize um, you know a lot of the manure that is left behind. Um, in their um, in their burrows because it helps them attract insects to the burrows. It also helps mask the smell of the of the nest and of the owls themselves, so it can um, give them an an added uh, protection um, against predators. So um, you know if you're if you are grazing in an area, as long as it's a um, you know responsible grazing. Um, the burrowing owls can coexist quite happily with cattle. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Camille. Um, are they particularly territorial to other families of burrowing owls during nesting? Um, it kind of depends on the availability of burrows. If everybody has, um, you know, a burrow that they can utilize and there's enough prey items, they will live in sort of a loose sort of community um, where you'll, you could often find several different owl families at once. You start to <clears throat> limit the availability of burrows or um, if there's a decrease in um, prey items, then they do become more territorial. Um, so you, you do have some factors that can change um, whether or not they're feeling territorial. Here at the center, um, all our owls, um, when they go back out into their outdoor enclosures in the, in the spring, once it's warmed up enough, everybody will find their, their own burrow, they'll choose a burrow, and typically that's the burrow that they will return to if they're feeling threatened or they need to get away from weather. And because there is a, um, you know, uh, enough burrows for everybody, they don't mind actually, you know, um, going back and forth and sometimes you'll see them um, chatting with each other and going down into the burrows and checking other burrows out, but everybody will return to their home burrow. And about the only time we see any territorialism here at the center is perhaps when we have a nesting pair and then mom and dad will become a bit more territorial just because 
um, everybody's in a bit closer quarters and um, they're very dedicated parrots so they're very good at um, warning everybody else away from from the nest and from the chicks um, so again you know you you do have some factors that can make them more territorial but generally they're not very aggressive towards um, towards each other great uh, so just to maybe finish up um, did you want to talk about uh, maybe the center a little bit when it's open to the public and what's available for visitors to see there? Right. We're hoping to actually see a, a, a more normal season for us this year. Typically, we, um, we open up the Saturday of the long weekend in May, and then we're open seven days a week until the until the Labor Day weekend in September. And, um, you know, kind of depending on what uh, the COVID rules are going to be, um, we're probably going to go to a booking system this year again, um, just so that we can ensure that everybody stays happy and healthy when they visit the center. So um, if anybody's interested in visiting with us this uh, season, I would suggest um, closer to the time you think you might be in Moose Jaw is just to give our web web page a check out and see what what type of hours we're we're running at that particular time. And um, do you still have other um, animals there? Like I know you had a, I think a snake for a while and a little ground squirrel and another was it a another owl? Yeah, we do have a short-eared owl as well. Yeah. And we do have a pair of gophers or Richardson's ground squirrels. So we like to showcase, um, you know, how diverse the, the Saskatchewan prairies can be. So we do have a few extra little guests that you guys can visit when you come and see us. Great, thank you so much, Lori. That was a great presentation. It was so nice to see Peanut and learn more about burrowing owls. Well, thank you very um, much for having us out tonight. I think everyone loved seeing him, even though he was maybe a little bit uncooperative. <laughs> really uncooperative. <tonight. laughs> it's okay. He's cute. He is. It's, that that's think, that's what saves him most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, here, let me just share my screen again. There we go. Um, so on behalf of Nature Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, I would like to sincerely thank Ian and Lori for the great presentations this evening and to all our listeners for tuning in. Uh, thank you all very much for attending this workshop. You will receive an email after this presentation with a quick questionnaire. Please fill it out. It should only take you a few minutes. Um, for upcoming events, like the workshop next week, you can check out uh, the PCAP website, which is www.pcap-sk.org under upcoming partner events. And uh, remember to check out the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future for a recording of this video. And I haven't talked to Nature Sask yet about it, but maybe it'll be on their uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, so thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.